Hello, my name is Emily Dark, and I work for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection in the Indian River Lagoon Aquatic Preserves Office. And today I will be presenting to you about lionfish, um, the invasion of the Indo-Pacific lionfish, and what it might mean for our local waters here in the Indian River Lagoon. So uh, part of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection uh, is the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection, and that is what I work under. Um, if you don't know what FDEP is or Florida Department of Environmental Protection, it is also the uh, state parks. The state parks are under the umbrella of the FDP as well. Um, so in our office of the Resilience of Coastal Protection, we conserve and restore Florida's coastal and aquatic ecosystems for the benefit of the people and the environment. So we do a lot of education, research, restoration, lots of different things. Um, and here's a great map to show you uh, the lots of different aquatic preserves around the state. Um, and in the Indian River Lagoon here, we have seven. So our, our office um, manages the entire system, the seven aquatic preserves. Um, but the entire system around Florida, there's 41, including the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, which we co-manage with NOAA. So a lot of really special places around the state, including places like Apalachicola Bay, um, Rookery Bay, and Biscayne Bay. So lots of beautiful coastal areas. So here's a little zoom in of the Indian River Lagoon Aquatic Preserves, um, starting way up in Mosquito Lagoon, up in New Smyrna, all the way down, working our way down to the Loxahatchee River, Lake Worth Creek. Um, we also have the North Fork of the St. Lucie River and Turkey Creek and the Loxahatchee. So not only estuarine, but riverine systems. So really cool place to work for sure. So just real quick in our office, just some things that we do. We work uh, on oyster research. We do a lot of bird monitoring, rookery monitoring. We help with ground nesting birds that are threatened like the least turn, the oyster catcher. We manage the spoil islands. We do uh, leave no trace programs. And there's a picture of the beautiful St. Lucie River down there, um, just to show the riverine work we do. So we are all over the place and we do have volunteers and interns a lot doing an array of different activities. So today we will be talking about invasive species um, in general and some of the topics around that. And then we'll lead into lionfish and what that means. Um, so in terms of invasive species, or non-native species. I'm sure we've heard terms like non-native, non-indigenous, alien, exotic, referring to plants and animals, trees. But what does that mean? Um, I'm sure you've heard that term in biology class, maybe out um, if you've been doing work outside. So non-native plants or trees here in the US are not necessarily invasive if they're non-native. Uh, the coconut palms have a unique history that is intertwined with human history of migration, um, trade and colonization. The coconut palms uh, evolutionary history goes back to two main genetic groups, one from India and one from Southeast Asia. And from those locations, they spread around the world among or along with humans. Um, corn, we grow here in the United States, non-native. It's from Mexico thousands of years ago, not invasive. Um, soy, we also grow here in the United States, and that is non-native um, originally from Southeast Asia. Uh, and potatoes we, we have here, those are from South America. So how do we define what is non-native and what is actually invasive? Um, how do we do this? Scientists have actually been investigating the biological and ecological traits of particular species to see what ecological damage it may or may not cause. Um, this is kind of getting into whether or not it's invasive. So it is quite the debate. Um, ecosystems are complex, they're non-linear and always in flux. So whether or not changes to ecosystems due to introduced species are good or bad may depend on your perspective. Um, on ecosystem values. So maybe the introduced species contributes to ecosystem functioning. So it's, again, like I said, it's, uh, it's a topic of debate in ecology and biology. Um, what if a species is invasive in one location, but in, in, endangered in another? Um, the waddle-necked soft-shell turtle is native to China where they are endangered, but in the Hawaiian island of Kauai, they are considered invasive. So it really depends on context. Um, so, one thing we can bring to the argument is what is the impact on biodiversity? So that leads us into getting into invasive species. Um, just a really cool case study here of investigating a, a, a species that we always considered to be non-native. Uh, the European honeybee was thought to be brought here in the 1600s or it was brought here in the 1600s. Um, so we didn't think that we had native honeybees, 
But there was a recent discovery in Nevada, in the Stewart Valley Basin, in, the West Central, in West Central Nevada, of a 14 million year old fossil of a female bee. So that means that we did have bees. So then it leads into a whole new investigation of what species of bees did we have? Where did they come from? When were they here? And are they native? So we're always constantly learning new things about species um, in reference to non-native species um, as we go. So that is a really neat case study. So an invasive species is actually defined by the US Fish and Wildlife as an exotic species whose introduction into an ecosystem in which the species is not native is likely to cause environmental or economic harm or harm to human health. Um, so they are harmful to our natural resources, such as fish, wildlife, plants, and overall ecosystem health, because they disrupt the natural communities and ecological processes. So some examples of very invasive plants and animals, some you may have heard of. Uh, we have the Burmese python, which is a big crazy one invading the Florida Everglades and making their way north. They may not be a threat to humans, but they have definitely impacted natural uh, native species such as deer, raccoon, marsh rabbits, and bobcats, possums, um, which have declined up to 99% in some areas. Um, they are from Southeast Asia and they were released by humans. So that is an example of a very invasive species. The emerald ash borer, this uh, pest is from it's in Michigan, it started in Michigan in 2002 from their native habitats of Russia, China, and Japan. And since then, tens of millions of ash trees have been killed by them. Um, and their numbers continue to grow. Nutria, although very cute, these South American uh, animals were brought for the fur trade in the 1930s. And then when that fur trade collapsed, people just released them. And now they are really bad for native um, ecosystems, uh, wetlands and, uh, habitats for our native species in those wetlands. They cause, they cause soil erosion um, and degradation to native plants. Then we have the, uh, the European starling, which was brought by people who really loved Shakespeare uh, literature, and they were brought in the late 1800s, and they just, just uh, boomed into huge populations becoming pests. Um, large flocks uh, harassing livestock and um, they have just grown to populations of over 200 million in the United States. So that is another invasive species. Asian carp, uh, there's four species of carp that were brought to the United States. Um, they were brought for use in the aquaculture ponds and then flooding and accidental release. They have, they invaded the Mississippi River, which is like a, a river highway. So these fish had access to lots of rivers and streams and just um, populations grew and they cause serious damage to native fish populations throughout competing for food and habitat. So you can see in that picture there, there's just so many um, and they're trying to catch them there, but it doesn't seem like that, that will do much. Um, some examples of plants that are very invasive, uh, purple loosestrife, also um, clogging up wetlands and taking over and pushing out native species, um, Japanese honeysuckle, Japanese barberry, the Norway maple, English ivy. These are just examples of vegetation or plants that, that outcompete our native plants and take over um, and, and decrease biodiversity. Remember, we wanna remember that keyword biodiversity. How do these species impact um, you know, biodiversity, genetic diversity? So those are some, some examples. Um, leading into impacts of invasive species, uh, they have been labeled, the, a top threat to biodiversity in native species here. They do cost a lot in terms of mitigation, um, fixing some of these habitats that they have ruined. Um, we spend billions annually on this. There are management plans written and legislation to help create frameworks for um, local governments and municipalities to deal with them. And there is actually a 2016 to 2018 um, National Invasive Species Management Plan. Um, so it's a very serious thing. And coming to Florida here, we are actually a hotspot for invasive marine species. Um, and I always ask in class, well, why do, you, why do you think that? Why do you think Florida is a hotspot? Well, Florida is a hub of transportation. If you think about it, we have a lot of water. So we have a lot of ships coming and going. Um, 
Also, we have a very really nice favorable climate. We cover the temperate tropical ecotone. Um, so we have a lot of different habitats that, that species can flourish. Um, there are a lot of intentional and unintentional releases from aquariums and escapes from aquaculture. Um, also, perhaps extreme weather events like hurricanes and transfer through ballast water in ships or the things that grow on the ship's hull. So um, those are a lot of the ways in which we can get invasive species. Um, I'm sure uh, you have seen the curly tails or the, the red-headed agamas or the Cuban anoles, those lizards. Those are invasive species that I've seen in the last few years just um, flourishing and definitely moving and expanding. Um, so the thing though, most of these marine species, meaning fish that live in the ocean, a lot of these non-natives don't actually explode in populations. They're only seen in small numbers. Um, the emperor angelfish has been observed, this fish here on the bottom right, beautiful fish. Um, emperor, emperor angelfish has been observed off Pompano Beach or Deer, Deerfield Beach, Hillsborough Beach, um, actually about six or seven years ago, um, but not many more have been seen. Um, the other fish there on the top is a Mayan cichlid from Mexico or Nicaragua. That one actually can be found in freshwater. Um, it's very widespread and abundant in Florida. Actually, it occurs in mostly all freshwater and brackish water habitats south of Lake Okeechobee. So those are just some examples of some non-native. So bringing us to the lionfish here. Um, so I was saying that, that a lot of these fish in the ocean system and the marine system, we don't see a ton of these non-natives, maybe just one or two here and there, but the lionfish has made history because it is a marine fish that has established itself in the Atlantic and along the coast of Florida and has flourished, uh, turning to large, large populations. Um, and it's just, it's, it's basically um, made history doing this. Caught a lot of people off guard. So where did lionfish come from? The invasion of the lionfish was due to, likely due to home uh, releases from people's home aquariums. Uh, they do eat a lot, so maybe they ate everybody's fish and they got mad or they didn't want it anymore, it got too big, so they let them go. Um, they are very popular in the home aquarium trade. Um, here in the invading region, you can see in the red, you know, along the United States and South America, that's the invading region also over in, um, Southeast Europe there, uh, that's the invading region. And there are two species that make up the invading population, Pterois volatans and Pterois miles. very hard to tell apart. Um, but the blue and green regions uh, are where they are naturally from. And there's actually currently 11 recognized species, um, different species of the, the lionfish. But like I said, we just have two here in the invading, invading range. So getting into the lionfish, I always ask people in presentations, do you think lionfish are venomous or poisonous? Give you a second to think about that. Well, the answer is, let's see how many people are holding their hand up for poisonous. Lionfish are not poisonous, they are venomous. And I wonder if you know what the difference is. Um, I, I'd like to always ask that question because it, they are different. Poisonous means you have like a poison throughout maybe your skin or your tissue. Venom you administer through either a tooth or a spine. And you'll see lionfish here have uh, many different uh, fins, but they do have um, spines there you can see that have venom in them, they have grooves and they administer the venom when you are stuck by them. Um, so it, it's a lot of pain, it's a neurotoxin. Um, they are not poisonous because you can actually eat lionfish, which we'll get into a little bit later, but they are edible. Um, other things that have venomous barbs or spines, um, like the stingray, or I know catfish have a barb. Um, there's other fish that have venomous, not poisonous, venomous spines. So do you think a snake, say the coral snake, is venomous or poisonous? That'd be venomous, right? Because they have teeth and they administer the venom through their teeth. Another good question is whether or not you think jellyfish are venomous or poisonous. And I looked it up and apparently they are venomous, not poisonous. So watch out for those lionfish, they, they do hurt. So the invasion of lionfish, the history of it, um, the, there's many different people around the area reporting their sightings. And these red dots here in these maps are uh, just people reporting lionfish. So it doesn't mean that's only where they are. So that is, that is just people 
calling in or reporting on the online, those are where they see lionfish. And that is the state of Florida up there. And you can see how many there are. And quickly, I'm going to escape here and show you um, the, starting in the 80s, you got a few dots there in South Florida and then increasing. These are just the sightings. You can look, they made it up to New England in the summer there with the Gulf Stream. And then boom, filling in the Caribbean, the North Coast of South America, Central America, and just exploding. And remember, these are just sightings. So that is just a nice time lapse of sightings to show you how they moved. Um, so going back to the presentation. And the USGS has that non-native website, which is great. And they keep track of those sightings there. Um, and you can see in the National Marine Sanctuary, the keys there, how many, how many lionfish. So you saw how those red dots moved and it seemed kind of peculiar, right? So they started in South Florida and they moved up and then they went around. So if you think about it, why, why do you think that is? So these arrows are showing that. So they go up, right? 1980s, they go up and out to Bermuda, 2000. And then they fill in around the Caribbean and come around. It all has to do with ocean currents. So, and lionfish reproduction, right? So if the lionfish release their eggs and they don't just turn into baby fish right away, they float. Um, their larval duration is actually around a month. So if you think about it, they are at mercy of these currents. So they're floating around the ocean. And then for anywhere from 20 to 30 days, they become a little, it becomes a little fish that then goes into a habitat. But between then, you know, they're floating around in the currents. So that would explain the uh, distribution patterns in the beginning of their invasion. So why are there so many lionfish? Um, if we study invasive biology and we learn why things are invasive, right? We talked about that a little bit why they're invasive, they're causing problems in the ecosystems, they're causing problems for native species. But why are they doing that? And how are they reproducing? How, why are they doing so well? So in particular with lionfish, we are seeing so many really high densities. Um, and some of the things that make them really successful are lots of, um, well, lack of predators. So our predators like grouper and snapper aren't used to them. So they don't have a lot of predators. Um, lack of parasites. Um, our prey, our little fish that they're eating, don't know to swim away from them because they're a new predator. Uh, they also have bold behavior. They're not really afraid. They don't swim away, which is not really super appealing to our predators that might eat them. Uh, their hunting ability, they use their big fins to chase, corral, and they, they, uh, they blow a stream of water at the prey, actually, which turns them around facing them, and then they just gulp them right up. So they're really good predators. Um, Again, the ocean currents and temperatures carrying their eggs around, bringing them to different places. Um, they're also generalists when it comes to eating. They're not picky. So they don't have to be in particular areas or only look for particular prey because they'll just eat anything. When they're young, they eat crustaceans like shrimp and, and crabs. And then as they grow older, they turn into a fish diet. So they eat a lot of our native fish and they don't really care what kind as long as they can get their mouths on them. Um, they also have a wide range of environmental tolerances, um, and we'll get into them being in the estuary in the Indian River Lagoon and, and what that means in terms of their tolerances. So also, I got a quick, cool video here to show you, to show you, or give, give you an idea of their densities. This is off of Apalachicola Bay, and these people hunting lionfish, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But those all down there are lionfish. That is on a sunken plain. And there's a zookeeper, which is a device to keep yourself safe from the spines. So yeah, you can see there how they're hunting. But again, mostly I just want you to see the density of lionfish there on that artificial reef. So when you see that, that high density right there, well, do you think that our native fish, like what does that mean for our native fish? That looks pretty crazy. There's a lot of lionfish there. So that is, that's what's happening. You have these habitats that our native fish really like and need to be on because there's food and there's protection. But then you have these large populations of lionfish which um, are pushing them out or eating our native species. So you can really see there those high densities. 
So talking about the habitats that lionfish are in, um, there have been lionfish found in uh, deep coral reefs, shallow coral reefs, seagrass, mangroves, and there's a lionfish at a thousand feet. And since that picture, there has been a lionfish found at 1500 feet. So, and then human-made habitat. So I just covered many of the habitats that I could think of here and lionfish have been found in all of them. So that goes along with them being a habitat generalist um, at all life stages, when they're young and when they're adults. So what do we have a lot of here in the Indian River Lagoon? Seagrass, mangroves, human-made habitat. Oops, the lights went out. So lionfish in the Indian River Lagoon. This is actually what I studied for my master's. So I will present to you here what I studied and what I found. Um, first, I have a friend who was doing his PhD in the Loxahatchee River, uh, Zach Judd, and he was originally studying snook and oysters. And he found a lionfish upriver. You can see that dot way up there. Thank you. He found that a little pink dot way up river, if you can see that, that's the Loxahatchee River. He found a lionfish on one of his oyster reefs. And down here on the right, in that orangey water, that brackish river water, is a lionfish. So he decided to continue researching. And, uh, you know, this, is, this was really peculiar. There's a lionfish that we think of as a marine fish in the estuary a couple miles up. So he then continued to research lionfish in the Loxahatchee River and found a lot more. And he also did some tagging to see if they were staying in these areas. Um, and what he found was that in general, a lot of these lionfish were hanging around particular areas and not leaving for a while. They had site fidelity. Um, I guess if, if they find a spot that they feel safe and they can eat, why will they leave, right? So in the estuary, we have docks. We've got, sometimes we have things under the docks like rocks or um, sometimes people put debris down there to uh, create habitat. So the lionfish love that. Um, sea walls with grooves in them that can kind of sneak in there, hide in there, pilings from bridges, um, things like that they love. So Zach really uh, started looking at lionfish in the estuary. And then that inspired me to look further into that. Um, and the top there is one of my first pictures of a lionfish um, in the habitat, just kind of on the north side of the Fort Pierce Inlet there um, in the mangroves. So why does this matter? What, you know, why does it matter if we have lionfish in the Indian River Lagoon? Well, we can just, Think about why the Indian River Lagoon is so important. Um, it is essential fish habitat. And that means that we have nursery grounds. We have these very important habitats, the mangroves, the, the seagrass. Um, that is a, it's a place for many of our fish, commercial and non-commercial, that um, start their early lives. Some stay there their whole lives and then a lot of them move offshore. So we have a lot of very important habitat that provides for many different species of fish and many other organisms. But, um, economic importance as well, a lot of um, commercial and again, non-commercial fishing um, and biodiversity. We have one of the most biodiverse estuaries here. Um, again, cover the ecotone of uh, temperate and tropical, so many different species, very important. And when you have a, uh, an invasive species that's creating history for being very detrimental in the Indian River Lagoon, then it's obviously um, not a good thing. So, when I continued my research, I, I finished my master's in 2014. I started it in 2011. I did most of my field work in 2000 and a little bit in 2012 and finished it in 2013. Um, and I looked in all the inlets, um, the Ponce Inlet, Sebastian Inlet, Fort Pierce Inlet, um, the St. Lucie Inlet, and also continued down in the Jupiter Inlet. And what I wanted to know was, where are they? Am I gonna find more? And where am I gonna find them? How far away from the inlets? And more specifically, how are they using the mangroves? Um, I worked with Florida Fish and Wildlife to do my master's. Um, and I, they really wanted to know how the lionfish were using the mangroves because that is a super important habitat, as you know. Um, and then what sizes would I find? Would I find just babies? Would I find adults? Are they eating? Are they reproducing? Um, do I think that maybe they're just staying in their juvenile stages here and then moving offshore as adults? So I had all these questions that I thought I would try to answer. Um, and here are some photos of baby lionfish that I found. Um, there's a picture of a lionfish in the mangroves in the St. Lucie Inlet. And then I also tagged a few lionfish to see if they would move away or they would stay in their spots in the mangroves. Um, so I did all sorts of stuff. And what did we find? 
We found lionfish in all five Indian River Lagoon inlets um, and in the mangroves of those inlets, four out of the five. 17 out of the 27 tagged lionfish were recaptured or reseen um, at least once. And one fish was observed in the same location for 92 days in the mangroves, in the same exact mangrove spot. Um, and then a lot of the mangrove, uh, the lionfish that I, that were not tagged and that I caught, 92% um, of them in the estuary had food in their stomachs at the time of capture. And again, there is a, a juvenile lionfish in the mangroves there. And then I have some pictures of some things I found in their stomachs as a blenny and um, some shrimp. As I mentioned, when they're little, they eat a lot of shrimp. Also, you know, I really wanted to get into how they were using the mangrove habitat. Were we gonna find just babies in the mangroves or were we gonna find adults as well? Um, and what part, you know, what kind of areas in the mangroves did they like? And I really love this photo because it shows the different types of mangrove habitat underwater. We have areas where it's really dug out from the current and there's spots underneath, tucked in under the mangroves. And then we have the areas that are kind of gradual, that are really shallow at low tide, um, and then get a little bit deeper at high tide, but still might not be super deep. Uh, we found lionfish in both of those, but overall they really did like those uh, undercut areas where they could hide under the mangroves um, or just amongst the roots that were, that were down in the water. Um, so we also found a lot of those lionfish in the mangroves did have full stomachs. We did find juveniles and adult lionfish in the mangroves. So that means that perhaps, you know, I mean, the juveniles are in there eating, but we also have the adults in there eating and the mangroves do provide a safe haven for a lot of juvenile fish, um, but not necessarily if there's an adult lionfish hunting in the mangroves. So um, that's quite a concern for sure. Uh, and then dissecting, we also found uh, lionfish that were old enough and to reproduce. Um, and some of them, though we didn't observe any actually reproducing in the lagoon, so we can't say that they are, um, we did find some females with stages of um, coming close to spawning. So that's another great hit. If anyone wants to do a, a master's or a PhD on looking at lionfish reproduction in the lagoon, that would be a cool topic. Um, so here's just a graph showing the sizes of the lionfish we found. The top one is the mangroves. Though they're a little smaller on average in the mangroves than the other estuarine lionfish from maybe docks or bridges. Um, and then offshore lionfish were around the same size. So in general, that's just showing that yes, we did find adults on all these different habitats. Um, and here again is uh, a cool picture of some lionfish just cruising around in the mangrove habitat in the St. Lucie Inlet. How am I doing on time? Okay, so what is being done? Um, so now we know we have these lionfish off our coasts in our estuaries. Um, more people are doing research. There's a lot of great research happening. It's been happening with lionfish. Um, and one notable, again, I mentioned my friend Zach that did his PhD in the Loxahatchee. He did further research and wanted to look at the tolerance of lionfish at different salinities. Um, so if they're found in the estuary, which fluctuates salinity, then they must be able to adapt to lower salinities, he thought. So he did some in-lab experiments and actually did find that lionfish can withstand down to five PPT short periods, uh, shorter periods of time. So they can go really, that, that has a lot of implications so for where they can be and where they can go. So that means that they can go really far up into the estuarine, estuarine systems. So that was not really great news. Um, so a lot of research happening. Florida Fish and Wildlife has a whole team devoted to lionfish uh, research and education move around the state and they provide funding as well. Um, there was an order a harvest order. You do not need a, a fishing license to shoot lionfish and there's no limits to when or where. Well, yes, where, but not when and how many. You still have to follow the rules as to where you can fish or not fish. Um, they have a, a, a program called Reef Rangers, kind of like adopt a highway where you can adopt uh, a certain part of a reef or even maybe your own dock or part of the estuary. So you have a house and you've, you've got a dock and you know you have lionfish. Um, you can clean that up, get those lionfish out of there and report that. Uh, they have the lionfish challenge. Um, you can submit pictures if you, you know, you, you get a bunch of lionfish offshore and you can submit your pictures of how many you get and they'll send you, uh, I believe a coin or a t-shirt if you get more than 25. I should have brought my coins, got a few cool coins. 
Um, and then the sightings and the research, people keep reporting their sightings, which is really helpful. Local management, um, whether it be you know, a, a, a state or a county, um, all around the Caribbean and different areas, um, local management has devoted time or at least try to get an understanding of what lionfish, what their populations look like. Um, I know in certain areas in the Caribbean, they have maybe um, certain marine protected areas that they wanna keep clear of lionfish. So they'll have a team go out and, and get all the lionfish throughout the year. So a lot of local management devoted to that. Um, here in Florida, a lot of um, local management devoting time and management to, to lionfish. Also hunting competitions, there's a lot of lionfish specific hum hunting competitions. Uh, the, there's a Fort Pierce lionfish safari, and there was one in Sebastian as well, all around the state, on um, the Keys, the West Coast, where you try to get the most, the smallest, the largest, a lot of cool prizes, and Fish and Wildlife definitely partakes in a lot of those. Um, it's a great chance for education and um, getting the public aware of the issue, and that you can eat them. Commercial markets, a lot of restaurants sell lionfish, some here in Fort Pierce. Um, also, Whole Foods, I know they presented at a conference that I went to about lionfish, um, all 28 uh, Whole Foods in Florida try to constantly supply lionfish and they work with a lot of divers around the state to get those lionfish. Um, and they say they don't turn down a lionfish, they'll also take the little ones. So a lot of people trying to really get them in the restaurants, on the plates, in the stores um, to get them out of the water. There's also a lionfish removal and awareness day, which is May 19th. So a lot of things happening. Um, so FWC, Florida Fish and Wildlife, uh, promoting lionfish hunting. They do have this cool competition where they released tagged lionfish. And if you found them, there would be a cash prize. Also, they do award the lionfish king and queen. Um, so if you keep submitting how many lionfish you get, you shoot, um, you know, you could win if you get the most. If you keep, you got to just keep uh, sending in your numbers and uh, you get prizes, I know there's cash prizes and other prizes. So they try to make it fun and really promote getting these fish out of the water. Um, but importantly, also lionfish do provide, again, we talk about how they're, you know, they're made history. So they do provide a chance to learn about invasion biology. Um, like I said, they caught people off guard. They caught biologists off guard. Their populations exploded. So why and how and, and what can we do? So it really creates a new learning situation um, and perhaps will help better our management moving forward um, regarding invasive species. Um, and how can we deal with them, marine and aquatic? And also how can we gauge their impacts? We might not see the full impacts of lionfish until years down the road. Um, and it will be different um, across locations. Will it impact our fishing? Will it impact our native species populations? For example, they compete with snapper. They have a very similar diet. Um, so will they impact our snapper populations? Um, so also, you know, how can people get involved? How can you help? Um, you may not be a snorkeler or a diver and want to shoot lionfish. Maybe you want to eat them. So even just asking at local restaurants is, is help, is um, contributing to, to helping. Um, I worked at a restaurant where they serve lionfish for a season and it was the most popular dish. People loved it and they love to hear about it and they love to feel like they were helping their local environment. Um, also a quick note on being stung by lionfish. Um, there are many different devices to carefully um, deal with lionfish when you're, when you're diving or snorkeling and you're shooting them like you saw in that video. You have to use lionfish specific gear um, to protect your hands and to protect your body, things like this, the zookeeper, where you put the lionfish in here and it's hard and their spines can't get you. Um, no one has actually ever died from a lionfish sting, but it's not to say that it couldn't happen because you could have uh, experienced swelling. Um, I got stung in the hands and the fingers and my hands swelled up tremendously, uh, very painful. And it can be very dangerous if you're diving and you're deep down there and you get stung and you're bleeding and you know you might panic so it's just you just have to be really really safe um and again like i mentioned not uh spearfishing lionfish on places you can't like certain bridges and things like that so still following the rules but i like to point that out um that it is something that is fun to get into if you like spearfishing 
lionfish are a great opportunity to help your local environment um, and do it safely. Um, and that is what I have today for lionfish. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you learned something about invasive species and our invasive lionfish. <laughs>